Are you studying for your ATVL exams and finding flight planning a little bit tricky? If so, come with me over the course of this series and let's find out how to plan a flight. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the first in a new series all about flight planning. Flight planning is a very good practical application of various subjects that you might have studied already, such as meteorology, principles of flight, performance and mass and balance. If you haven't done so, I'd recommend probably doing those subjects first if you have a choice in the matter. And if you don't have a choice, I've made various videos on all four of those subjects I've just mentioned. Go back and watch those, pick out specific videos if you ever need a little more detail and clarification on any of the things that come up in flight planning. In this first class, we're gonna be taking a look at some of the basics, as well as loading and mass considerations when planning flight. Before we start on aircraft loading, we're going to have a quick look at some basic speed, distance, time calculations, just to warm up a bit and check that we understand how it all works. This is because the fundamental reason for planning a flight and the flight planning subject in general is to make sure that we have a safe route, avoiding any weather and mountains that we can't fly over, and ultimately so that we can take the correct amount of fuel so we don't run out of fuel in the middle of the sky. To do this, we need to know for how long we'll be flying and based on the distance and the speed we're going to travel at. You might be thinking, come on Grant, I've been doing these sorts of calculations since I was about 12 years old, but the introduction of wind when we're flying a plane can make it a little bit weirder to understand. So when we have wind involved, we have two speeds to considering when we're planning a flight. We've got the true airspeed and the ground speed. And the ground speed is just equal to the true airspeed plus any wind component that we have. A headwind will slow us down and a tailwind will speed us up. If we had a TAS of 100 knots and a 10 knot tailwind, the ground speed would be 110 knots, for example. Simple. We also need to be able to pick out the head tailwind components using trigonometry. And what we do is we basically use the difference in the angle between the longitudinal axis and the wind, and then we have to multiply by the cosine of the angle to find the head uh, slash tailwind. And then if we use the sine, we get the crosswind. So if we had uh, the longitudinal axis of a plane like that, wind coming in here, 30 degrees off, basic trigonometry, we would have the component parts, which are gonna be our headwind, and our crosswind, we would say that sine of the 30 times whatever this wind was here would give us the crosswind, and the cosine 30 times whatever the strength of the wind is would give us our headwind in this case. If we draw and measure a line on a chart, we are measuring the distance over the ground. So we would use the ground speed to calculate how long it takes to travel along this line. Let's put some nice easy numbers to it and say that when traveling at 100 knots ground speed, we covered this 100 nautical mile line in one hour. So that would be our nautical ground miles over the time. If we had a headwind of 20 knots, then that would mean that our actual true airspeed of this aircraft is 120 knots, but the headwind is slowing us down so that our ground speed only equals 100 knots. We still travel along the line for one hour, but if we plug that into our V equals D over T calculation, we can see that we're actually gonna be traveling 120 nautical miles through the air. So we can say that our true airspeed is our nautical air miles over the time. So we travel 120 nautical miles through the air, but only 100 nautical miles over the ground because of this wind. And it's important to understand the difference as there could be a very large difference and how far you fly along the ground versus how far you fly through the air might be very different and that could have implications for fuel planning, how long you're actually gonna be in the air, you might not have enough to get to your destination, for example. This next part of the video will make so much more sense if you've studied mass and balance already, or you can go back and watch some of my first ever videos that I made explaining mass loading in a bit more detail. Apologies for the quality. And this is just gonna be a quick refresher of that sort of thing. So we've got our all up mass, which consists of these four elements here. It is the basic empty mass, variable load, traffic load, and fuel. The basic empty mass is just the aircraft weight plus any non-removable equipment and liquids, such as hydraulic fluid, um, oil, 
fire extinguishers, things like that. It would also include any fuel that we're using as a ballast if that is something that we need to do. The variable load is what you would call the sort of the operational load. It's items that can be removed from the aircraft and they sort of vary depending on the flight. So it could be that you've got a large galley, a lot of food and drinks on board for a very long flight, but a short flight you wouldn't load as much on. So that's why it's variable. But this also includes all the crew and their bags, as well as any uh, potable water, so drinking water and water used for the toilets. The traffic load is the stuff we can sell. So it's either passengers or cargo space and the cargo itself. Um, and because of this fact that we can sell it and they pay for it, this can sometimes be called the payload as well. Fuel, uh, I'll break down a bit more in the next class, but we divide it into a few sections and assign it to certain things. For example, we have some taxi fuel, some trip fuel and some fuel for diverting to uh, an alternate airport if we need to do that. We have the dry operating mass. So that's our, sorry, that was our all up mass and then we can sort of group them together in different ways. Our dry operating mass would be these two together. So that's dry operating mass instead of wet operating mass. That's a way to think of it because this is how, what we'd need to fly the aircraft to whatever destination without any fuel on board. And if we add any fuel, we get the operating mass. So that's what we actually need in order to take this plane to whatever destination we're going to. I like to think of it as the dry operating mass and the wet operating mass, and the wetness comes from adding in the fuel. We have these two grouped together, which is sometimes called the usable or useful load. I don't know why it's called that, but it's the traffic load plus the fuel. And the zero fuel mass is just these three without any fuel. It's quite simple. It's the, the uh, all up mass minus the fuel to give us zero fuel mass. And there's a few acronyms for remembering this kind of thing. Uh, the one that I used, and it's very silly, but it is easy to remember, is uh, be very tall for dunking, like in basketball, unbelievably awesomely awesome spelt oz at the start that's my rubbish one um one that i got commented on in one of my mass and balance videos was uh, big vans travel fast down under in oz as in australia so whichever one works for you make up your own one um just to remember the components of the all up mass and any groupings so at various points throughout the flight, we will also have snapshots of the weight at that point in the flight because the weight changes as we burn fuel. Um, and there's some limitations for them and there's some uh, sort of things that you need to understand about these various little uh, snapshot masses. So the first one we've got is ramp mass. This is all the fuel, the block fuel basically is what you call it. That's the fuel that you have when you're before you start the engines, when you're on the gate about to get pushed back in your aircraft. It includes all the passengers, and this might be limited by the maximum ramp mass or a maximum taxi mass. We have the takeoff mass. So this is the mass when we start the takeoff roll, which will be uh, just the ramp mass minus any fuel that we've used to taxi. This will be limited by the conditions of the day the runway characteristics and the structural limitations of the aircraft itself in the forms of the maximum structural takeoff mass and of course the performance limited takeoff mass which is sometimes called the field length limited takeoff mass. What we do is we basically pick the more restrictive of either the structural or the performance limiting takeoff mass and whichever one is more uh, restrictive and therefore a bit safer for us we would call the regulated takeoff mass. The landing mass is the mass when we land and this will be the takeoff mass minus any fuel we have burned getting there. This will be limited again by the structural limits and the performance limited, just like the takeoff. And the maximum values for uh, structural masses will often be lower for a landing mass because the actual landing procedure touching down puts a lot of strain on the wheels and the tires. So we basically can't handle as much weight pressing into the uh, the tarmac and the wheels when we're landing. Again, just like we did for the takeoff mass, we take the lower of the two values 
and we call it the regulated landing mass. The zero fuel mass is the mass before any fuel goes in, unsurprisingly, and it will be limited by a maximum zero fuel mass value. And this seems like a strange limitation. Why is there a limit on how unfilled the aircraft can be with fuel? But basically what happens is, say you have an aircraft in here, all the force is being generated, uh, all the lift force is being generated by the wings. And normally what happens is the fuel is stored in here and that sort of creates a pulling down motion to stop any stresses and strains at the wing roots. If we have zero fuel, that means that we're not getting this counteractive pulling down motion at the wing root. And that means that the wing uh, can only produce a certain amount of lift. That means it can only take a, an amount of uh, maximum zero fuel mass to stop this bending motion and cause unnecessary strain on the wing. So hopefully that makes sense because the weight of the aircraft equals the lift. So if you don't have this extra thing pulling us down, then it bends the wings up like this and it can cause unnecessary strain. Hopefully that makes sense. There's plenty of videos out there explaining uh, maximum zero fuel mass in a bit more detail, probably with a better uh, drawing than I've just done there and a little bit more in depth. But it's a uh, structural limitation caused by the strength of the connection of the wings to the aircraft body. So zero fuel mass is limited by a maximum zero fuel mass uh, value. So we have to be aware of all of these limits and values so that we don't exceed any of the limitations and only take as much mass as we can physically fly with. And that's what we get to our allowable takeoff mass. So our allowable takeoff mass is basically a combination of all those uh, limitations that we just saw in the previous uh, bit of paper. So let's say you're at an airport with a really long runway so you can make take as much mass with you as you would like for takeoff, up to the maximum structural limit for takeoff, obviously. You take off absolutely fine as you're not limited by performance. But when you get to your destination airport, you realize you're above the maximum landing mass. What do you do? Well, you can hold and burn fuel, wasting time and money and creating more unnecessary uh, pollution and noise pollution um, to bring you back down below the maximum structural performance limited landing mass. But this is not a good situation to be in. This is just a waste of time and money and effort. So what we should have done is we should have calculated our maximum allowable takeoff mass taking into account all the various limits. So this is either the maximum zero fuel mass plus takeoff fuel, the regulated takeoff mass, or the regulated landing mass plus any trip fuel. And we take the most restrictive of these values. This is so that first, we don't take off with just enough fuel to get to the destination, leaving us at our maximum zero fuel mass at the destination. This means that there would be no more fuel in the wings, pushing back against the lift that's being created. And this means that the wings bend upwards and create that excessive force at the wing root. The second limit is hopefully fairly easy to understand. We can't take off above our regulated takeoff mass, which will be the lower of either the structural or the performance limiting takeoff mass. The third limit refers to uh, the one I used in the example at the start of that hypothetical flight. If we take off too heavy and ha haven't burnt enough fuel by the time we get to the destination, we could be at risk of landing above the regulated landing mass and have to hold um, and yeah, waste time, energy and money. So an example of how we'd use our allowable takeoff mass is something like this. What is the maximum allowable takeoff mass for the 737-800 with the following information? Various weights there that I'll pull out as necessary. Um, we can do this basically by arranging things into a table with those equations at the top that we just saw. So the first line of the table is going to be the maximum zero fuel mass plus takeoff fuel. Then we're going to have the regulated takeoff mass and the regulated landing mass plus trip fuel. So what is our maximum zero fuel mass? Well, our maximum zero fuel mass is here. It's 62731 plus the takeoff fuel. The takeoff fuel is going to be what we had at the start of the day, which is normally called our block fuel, sometimes we called our ramp fuel and then we take off any fuel that we've used to taxi out to the runway. So it's going to be 7500 minus 200 
which is going to be 7300. Zero, zero. And that means that we're going to get an answer of 137,031 uh, kilograms. Then we go into the regulate takeoff mass, which is quite easy because we've got a structural limit and a performance limit. We take the lower of the two. We are limited by our performance today. So that's going to be 73,000 kgs. And then the last one, we have our regulate landing mass plus trip. So our regulated landing mass is going to be the lower of the uh, maximum landing mass or the performance limiting takeoff mass. So in this case, it's our maximum landing mass, maximum structural landing mass. So we're looking at 65317. And then we add on the trip fuel, which has very handily been removed for us. So we've got 2,300 kilograms, making 71676 kilograms. So out of all of these, our maximum allowable takeoff mass is going to be this one over here, because that means that when we arrive at our destination, we're not going to be above our landing mass. So once we have our answer, we would have to load the aircraft appropriately so that we don't exceed this limit. Um, with passengers and bags, we could find out the maximum traffic load we can take in these certain conditions. In reality, this seems like quite an excessive amount of fuel to take for only having a trip fuel of 2,300 kilograms, which is about an hour long flight in a 77-800. But you do need to take a good amount of fuel extra, which is something we're gonna have a look at and break down in the next class. To summarize then, we've got our basic speed distance time calculations, remembering that there is a difference between the nautical air miles and the nautical ground miles that are covered and the basic difference revolves around the wind changing our true airspeed to a ground speed. But then we have the breakdown of our all up mass, which is basic empty mass, variable load, traffic load and fuel. We group together our basic empty mass and our variable load to get our dry operating mass. We then add fuel and we'd get our wet operating mass or just our operating mass. If we group together our traffic load and our fuel, we'd get our usable load and so a useful load and or is it usable? It's one of those two. I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Um, and then if we take these three at the top, we have our zero fuel mass, our mass of the aircraft without any fuel. We then get various snapshots of the fuel throughout, uh, sorry, the mass throughout the day based on how much fuel we burnt. So our ramp mass would be our mass at the start of the day before the engines start. This is going to be maximum amount of fuel on board, all the traffic load, variable load and uh, basic empty mass on board. This could be limited by a maximum ramp mass value or maybe a maximum taxi value. Then we have our takeoff mass, which is basically we've burned a slight amount of this fuel in terms of taxi fuel, limited by either the performance limited takeoff mass or the structural limited takeoff mass. We then have a landing mass, which will be the fuel that we've used uh, the weight minus the fuel that we've used to get to our destination. So that's going to be the trip fuel, the taxi fuel, maybe holding, that kind of thing. And the landing mass limitations will be structural and performance limited just by like the uh, takeoff mass limitations. Although the structural, take, the structural landing mass will more often be less than the structural takeoff mass because of the impact of actually landing on the runway, there's only a certain amount of weight that the wheels can take plus the forces of actually coming down. And then you've got the zero fuel mass, which is limited by a maximum zero fuel mass value, basically to do with the wings bending and causing excessive forces on the wing roots. We don't want to exceed any of these limits. So what we can do is we can calculate an, uh, an allowable takeoff mass, which means that we take into account all these limits for the various points in flight. So we'd have our maximum zero fuel mass plus the takeoff fuel, the regulated takeoff mass and the regulated landing mass plus any trip fuel. And we take the lower of those values and that would be our limit for the day.